Go inside the Crimson Tide. Tighter Insider TV with Rodney Orr and Carrie Harris. It was another great run to Oklahoma City by the Alabama softball team, but Saturday after knocking off Oregon in an elimination game, the Crimson Tide was bounced by the LSU Tigers by a final of 5-3. to three. Pat Murphy's team finishes the season 48-15. and 15. And good evening, everybody, and welcome into another edition of Tider Insider TV, presented each and every week by Buffalo Rock. Alongside Rodney Orr, I'm Gary Harris. Rodney Orr, of course, from TiderInsider.com. And uh, once again tonight, our program brought to you by Buffalo Rock. And we're enjoying outstanding Diet Pepsi, nice and cold. As always. So, Rodney, another outstanding year. For the Tide and Pat Murphy, the bats uh, just picked a bad time to go cold. They just couldn't come up with enough big hits out there in Oklahoma City. Yeah, they really couldn't. You know, they pitched it pretty well, Gary. And uh, when you look at it, I think that uh, really what they need, they need some more hitters. You remember a few years ago when they made it all the way to the championship and they kind of fell short and felt like what they needed was some more power and they went out and got it and I think it produced and helped them win a national championship. And I think when you look at this team right here, you know, I, you hate to say overachieved because they really earned everything they got, but you know, they probably got as much out of this team as you possibly could have. They lose five seniors, Danae Hayes, Jaden Spencer, Daniel Richard, Chauncey Bell and Leslie Jury, but the heart of this team is back. Players like McClenney, Runyon, Demi Turner, the list goes on and on. And another big recruiting class is coming in, so Patrick Murphy is high on the future. We have six young ladies coming in, uh, two from Texas, two from Alabama, our first Arkansas and our first Mississippi young lady. And uh, there's two pitchers in the group, a lefty and a righty, both players of the year in their state. At one point, um, the two kids from Texas both throw right, hit left, both are fast. Uh, they're more hitters than slappers. So we're looking forward to having a couple more lefties to join Haley and, and run you. It's going to be a fun year next year. I'm looking forward to Haley being a senior and her three other um, classmates. I know they're going to show great leadership and, and we'll do amazing things again. That's Pat Murphy discussing recruiting and building a consistent winner. He certainly has a good role model in Nick Saban. The Tide football team got a couple of more commitments for the 2017 class. First, Rodney, let's discuss a big uh, road grader offensive lineman for the state of Georgia in Notori Johnson. Yeah, he's really big, Gary, when you talk about uh, size for a guy his age, especially. You know, he's six foot four, he's 340 pounds, came to camp, uh, had, has an offer, and uh, committed to Alabama yesterday, Gary. And again, I think when you look at him, he fits that mold of what Alabama's had in the past. You know, these big, strong, physical uh, offensive linemen. You look at him there, I think probably he was at tackle there, but probably projects on the inside in college as a guard. And uh, he is a big, big guy, as we mentioned, 6'4", 325 pounds. Coach Saban already likes his footwork, so another big pick, pick up for the class of 2017. Of course, the first one was running back Najee Harris back in April, and this 17 class is already growing. Let's take a look at another guy that uh, Alabama picked up on Monday. And this is a wide receiver out of Mississippi. You wrote about him back in April on TiderInsider.com. Let's discuss D.D. Uh, Bowie and, and uh, you know, why you think and some others think that he compares to Amari Cooper. Just a really explosive player, Gary. Great speed. When he gets on the field, he has tremendous acceleration, uh, you know, tremendous hands. He even wears number nine, so he lo looks a little bit like Amari from that perspective as well. And I think when you look at him, he's probably one of the best receivers already. You know, when you talk about nationally for 2017, you look at his ability there to avoid people once he makes the play and makes the catch. I think he had 25 receptions last year for, you know, over 800 yards, uh, 12 touchdowns receiving so half of his receptions went for touchdowns just a playmaker that's all you can really say about him talked to him this afternoon told me he feels like even though it's really early uh, he's going to be solid to Alabama even though again now let's be clear there's still 18 months or so before they sign and here are the numbers on Bowie a very similar body type as we talked about to Amari Cooper he held offers from several SEC teams already now again these are 2017 
commitment. So you don't have to hold on to just February of next year. You've got to hold on to February of 2017. And as we've seen, the recruiting process goes back and forth. But also, Rodney, often and more often than not, when a guy commits to a school early, that is the team to beat, even if others come after yeah. him. And, and most of the time, they wind up going to that school. Most of the time, yeah. I think we've, you know, certainly in the last few years, we've seen more flipping back and forth, and, you know, that's become more prevalent. But I think, you know, when you're talking generally speaking, most of the time, the school they originally commit to is where they end up. All right, a guy who may be throwing to Bowie eventually in Tuscaloosa is Alabama freshman quarterback Blake Barnett. The freshman is vying for the starting job left vacant by Blake Sims. It's been reported that he's getting a little help from famed quarterback guru George Whitfield. He began working with him earlier this month. That's according to Blake's father. Whitfield has worked with several college and NFL quarterbacks in the past. I mean, he is known as the best in the business, so not a, uh, a bad idea to work with that guy. And Roddy, it would be a surprise if indeed Barnett starts. This is the number of attempts first-year starters under Nick Saban have had when coming in. Right now, Barnett has zero, being a true freshman. Jake Coker with 95 between his time at Florida State and last year as a backup is the most experienced quarterback on the Tide roster as we sit here today. Still to more to come on Tider Insider TV. We'll welcome your calls in just a bit. But when we come back, Jen Chapman goes one-on-one -on -one with Alabama's national championship golfer Emma Talley. She talks about being a champion and gives Jen a little golf lesson in the process. And coming up, we'll be welcoming your phone calls, emails, and tweets. You see the information right there on your screen. Interact with Tider Insider TV right now. So go ahead and give us a call. Send us an email or contact us on Twitter using the hashtag Tider Insider TV. We'll be right back after this. Just last week, Alabama junior golfer Emma Talley was busy winning the NCAA Women's Individual Championship in Bradenton, Florida. She held off charges from two golfers on the back nine to fire a three under for the tournament and bring home the first individual title in Crimson Tide women's golf history. Of course, Bama has a women's team title and two men's teams title, but the first time that a woman has won an NCAA individual championship for the Crimson Tide. And our own Jen Chapman got the chance to go one-on-one, -on -one, not with uh, just with some questions, but with a little golf on the course as well. Let's take a look. Emma Talley, next to your name, it now says NCAA champion. Has it sunk in? No, it has definitely not sunk in. It hasn't had time yet. And also, I'm trying to get prepared for my next tournament on Tuesday. And then after that, I think I'll have a little time to think about it. <laughs> and then you can celebrate. Yes. It was such a memorable way to win. With that 52 minute wait before you could go back out there and putt, what was going through your mind during those 52 minutes? Um, it really was kind of a blessing in disguise. I mean, the bottom line is, um, I was a little anxious after the bunker shot into the green. I was very anxious at the beginning, so I, I keep telling everybody I think it's a blessing in disguise because I knew that I needed to make that putt because I knew that somebody was going to make a birdie coming in to have some cushion, and I know that would give me a better chance of like holding out. Um, someone could have come and beat me as well because they had several more holes left, and then I told Mick it's it's funny how um, my nerves left me while I was waiting, and then. As soon as I stepped back on the green, all those nerves came rushing back to me, but thankfully, um, I made the putt. How about the wait while the other girls were finishing their round? What was that like for you? That was the worst part of the whole week. Um, I, I know how my parents feel for sure now. That was so sickening, and I did not know what to think. I mean, the, one girl had two pretty easy, not easy holes, but birdie holes, birdie opportunities coming in, and uh, she almost knocked it on, in on the last hole, too. So. It was very nerve-wracking. That was definitely the hardest part. So you've already won an amateur title. You win an NCAA title. People are asking, are you going to stay for your final year at Alabama, or is this where you go pro? Which are you choosing and why? Um, I'm actually staying. I think it's really important to get a degree, and also I get one more year to, year of being a kid. So um, I'm really excited about my senior year, and we'll see how it goes. So with the NCAA champion, Emma Talley, and I have no golf experience whatsoever, except I have played Wii Golf for the last couple years with my 94-year-old friend, George. 
and believe it or not, it took me 14 months to beat him in a game of Wii Golf, and I've only in the last couple of years beat him a handful of times. So awesome. that is my golf experience. So George, thanks Hi, for George. teaching me. Yeah, <laughs> he's taught me everything I know, but I do not know how to play out on the actual green. So it's all you, Emma. All right, well, first just keep your eye on the ball and just whack it. Just whack it. Oh, you gotta keep your eye. You were too excited. Eye on the ball. <laughs> <Up. laughs> I'm good at making sound effects. <laughs> too early. <laughs> Made a divot. No, you, that's normal. <laughs> <laughs> I think I need to stick to Wii Golf. Well, not very good at Wii Golf either. <laughs> I'll stick to running. <laughs> if you're gonna come back, come back, shoulder. Shoulder to shoulder and follow through so much that you almost have to step forward. That's how fast you wanna swing forward. Shoulder like that. <laughs> but, <laughs> you don't really wanna do that, but that's just what you Oh, I don't do like. it. <laughs> just shoulder to shoulder. Yeah, that was good. Question, how do I know where it's going out there? Um, well, you have to learn how to line up, but that's another, <laughs> we'll save that for another day. Okay. Oh, that one really was Ooh. good too. How's the, it's getting better. It is getting better. We've got a lot to practice. So uh, let's end on someone who actually knows how to do it. So Emma can show us how this. it's really done with the driver. Now Jen's a natural athlete, so yes, yeah, she whiffed a few, but you saw when she finally made contact, she slapped it on down there pretty I good. I think Emma has a future, you know, giving instructions. Well, I mean, she's she, got a, she brought her along there. She's, yeah, she's got a future on the LPGA yeah, Tour. Well, afterwards. Yeah, and uh, Jen can, if she starts playing, she'll be able to, to hit her, hit it around and get in some of these tournaments with me. And, uh, you know, it's always an advantage to have a, a, a female that can really play because they get to play on the upper tee and you get a lot of extra distance that way. All right, more TI TV to come, including a landing spot for Blake Sims, where he'll suit up in 2015. That's coming up. And next, we'll be welcoming your phone calls, emails, and tweets. Again, the information posted there on your screen on how you can get in touch with us. So go ahead, give us a call at 205-348-9882. We'll be right back with the only show that takes you inside the Crimson Tide, Tider Insider TV, right after this. Blake Sims' goal of playing in the National Football League hasn't worked out yet, but he will be playing quarterback in professional football. For the CFL's Toronto Argonauts, they signed him to a three-year contract. He's getting ready, as you see right there, to play the position, and uh, he says he's already gotten a crash course with the team, and uh, you know what? That's a style of game up there that fits him, and they'll be surprised if he does very, very well. It's been kind of crazy, you know, I'm just trying to keep uh, 10 toes down and stay above water and just try to stay positive, try not to overwhelm myself a lot of times. And uh, just, just the main thing for me, I think, is just staying positive and just keep looking for it. All right, Blake Sims, we've been talking a lot about him, and, and I think anybody who watches the show knows I'm a big Blake Sims fan, but uh, he's got stick to uh, he's got uh, the work ethic, and you know, I know he prefers to play quarterback, so I think this is a blessing in disguise. I, you know, if he could have made an NFL roster, I'm sure he would have rather have done that, whether it was at running back or special teams or whatever. But now he can go to Canada and focus strictly on being a quarterback, Rodney, which is his number one goal. Yeah, and, and you know, again, I agree with you, Gary, getting that experience. And we've seen po uh, quarterbacks in the past. You know, you really never know what can happen in the future. Remember, how many years did Warren Moon spend a in the bunch. CFL? Had a great career there, came and was very successful in the NFL. So, I mean, you never really know, but certainly it does allow him an opportunity to, you know, continue to play that position and as a player, be a player. And, uh, you know, we'll see how, it, you never know what might be in his future. Warren Moon's a Pro Football Hall of Famer. Can you imagine those seven or eight years that he was up there in Canada, if he'd have been in the NFL, yeah. he might have put up numbers that uh, everybody's still chasing. All right, it's time to head to the phone lines. First up tonight, our buddy over in Anniston, Harold. Harold, what's going on, man? Hey, how you doing, guys? Very well. Hey, uh, I was listening to what Rodney said earlier, man, about the uh, softball team, and I think he's right, man. With teams like LSU, Florida, and even Auburn, man, we got to get uh, more power, man. If we don't, we're not going to be able to compete. 
Well, you know, Harold, I, I, they didn't have the power numbers that they've had in the past, but I, I think Patrick Murphy knows what he's doing. No, no offense to any of those other programs, but this is a program that went to the College World Series for the first time in 2000, has been 10 times in 15 years, won the first ever Women's College World Series in the Southeastern Conference, finished runner-up another two times. You know, I, I think he knows what he needs to do, Rodney. I really well, do. Well, I, I do, too. And, but I understand exactly what Harold's saying. Sometimes in recruiting, you know, there, there comes a time when, you know, you, you, you find yourself short in certain areas or certain things that you really need. And I think when you look at this team, I would have to agree with, with Harold. I don't think that they were as productive as, as they could have been at the plate. I think if they would have been a little bit more uh, productive there in the World Series, you know, these opportunities that they've had, maybe they would have been a little bit more successful. But then again, I'm not taking anything away from the team. I think Coach Murphy got everything he could out of this team. They had an outstanding year. And I think as he continues to recruit, and he's one of the best recruiters in the country, he's like Nick Saban in football, I think as he continues to do that and he fills his holes, I think he's going to have a stronger lineup, and I think they will continue to compete and play on a very high level. Yeah, I just trust him to get it fixed. If he thinks he needs more power, I think he'll get it. They signed six players in the early signing period, two from the state of Alabama, outstanding pitcher uh, Matty Moore from Winfield just up the road, and a first baseman, Caroline Hardy from Vestavia, who has some pop. So, Harold, I I think he'll he'll get it right. And let, you know, I know everybody wants to hit a lot of home runs, but let me tell you this: first thing it starts with pitching. If you don't have a, a big time pitcher, you've got no chance. I don't care how many home runs you hit. He's got that in Osorio. He's got uh, you know good pitching to build around, and I think they'll get the power numbers up next year. All right, let's uh, keep moving along here. Take an email question. This is from David over in Center. Would you please tell me what the University of Alabama is doing to correct the problem with it? Alabama being near the bottom of the SEC in cost of attendance. Well, I don't know that, first we're still trying to learn how all this works, David. There's supposed to be some transparency. I don't know that you can fix it. I mean, if you you, know, you look at your numbers and you and you turn in an honest evaluation of what it, a cost of attendance amount is, and that's about all you can do. I think what if other schools are higher, then there's, uh, yeah, what else can asking, you do about it? Is everybody being honest? And I think that's the key. We have to get to the point where, every, you know, it's kind of more of a level playing field, Gary. I think, you know, certainly Coach Saban's addressed that. I mean, what kind of unfair advantage is it for one school to be, you know, significantly higher than others? And, and really what I would question is how can one school, you know, if you look back one year and there are a certain number, double the next year. I mean, it's really kind of odd. But well, they're working on all of it, and uh, it's it's a work in progress. There's no doubt about it. Everybody wanted the athletes to get more and get something, and they're going to, and now it seems to be raising a, a whole other series of issues. Well, still more to come on Tide or Insider TV. Next, we'll get a look at some Crimson Tide rookies posing for their very first trading cards and more of your phone calls, emails, and tweets. Again, the information right there on your screen. You can get in touch with us, and uh, we want to hear from you. So give us a call right now. Phone lines are open. We'll be back after this. The late great Derek Thomas was the last former Crimson Tider to enter the College Football Hall of Fame. Next year, it could be Bobby Humphrey. The Hall announced its names who are on the ballot for the 2016 class, and the former Crimson Tide running back is on the list. Hump was a two-time All-American while in Tuscaloosa, and uh, we're going to run out of video here, but this is probably, in my opinion, the best run he ever had against yeah. Penn State in the rain. Yeah. Yeah, you, you talk night. about a recruiting class. How about that recruiting class, 1985? Bobby Humphrey, uh, Derek Thomas, Gene Jelks, yeah. Larry Rose. That was a pretty good class. Al yeah. Bell. Yeah. Remember Al Bell? I remember Al, Al Bell well. Yeah. And uh, Bobby Humphrey might have been the best of the lot, of course, uh, trying to join his buddy, the late, great Derek Thomas, I said, in the College Football Hall of Fame. All right, let's head right back to the phone lines. BT is with us in Tuscaloosa. Hey, BT, what's going on? Not much, Gary Harris. How about you? Well, I'm hanging in there. Hey, Ronnie, how you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well, BT. I want to ask about uh, the quarterback situation, uh, Gary and Rodney. You know, I don't know what's still up in air or, do you know, how's it going to work or what. Well, BT, I think we still have a lot to learn about the quarterback position. You know, they played five this spring, and I really don't think when you look at it that they've, you know, drawn any specific conclusions in terms of who's one, two, and three right now. I think in August camp that'll be a really big issue in terms of, you know, people talking about it. But I think, you know, the coaching staff probably has a little bit of an idea which direction they're going. I would think that Jacob Coker is certainly going to be one of the guys and, and uh, David Cornwell. You know, we'll see what happens with Alec Morris, Cooper Bateman, and Blake Barnett. But I, 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 th I got a hunch right now, Gary, that it's probably Jacob Coker and, and David Cornwell, the top two. Yeah, this much we know, they're going to have one. They're going to have somebody's going to be out there taking the snaps. I do think it would have been 
preferred if they could have had a starter coming out of spring, but they went into August last year without one, and it worked out pretty well. All right, let's go back to the phones and talk to uh, CB. CB, how you doing, man? Fine, man. My, my, I'm having a little cable trouble. Can y'all hear me? Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Won't you go on and tell these folks riding in gear and let's get them charged up? Alabama going to win the SEC. <laughs> you know, I'm tired of hearing about I ain't hearing nothing. I, they going to get it. What you think? Oh, well, they're going to have a shot. I mean, if you look back at uh, Nick Saban, it, of course, it's tough to win it. He's only won three in eight years, but really in 2009, lost in the championship game. Even in 2010, going into Baton Rouge in November, Alabama was right there in the thick of it. Uh, 2011, didn't win it, but won the national championship. 2012, won it. And, of course, won it last year, 2013, would have played for the championship without the kick six at Auburn. So Alabama's always in the hunt, Rodney, for the SEC championship. Well, and, and let me say this, winning back-to-back -back SEC championships, I don't think it's been done since Tennessee did it, what, 97, 98? Yeah. So it's been a long time, CB. It's not an easy thing to do and especially do it back-to-back. -back. I think this team certainly has all the, you know, a lot of pieces, a lot of tools. I think they're going to be really good defensively. But I think, you know, if they can get that quarterback situation settled, I think they've got a real good chance. I said 2009. Of course, it was 2008 they lost to Florida. And they SEC championship came back to win it in 2009 by beating the Gators and then winning the national championship as well. All right, thanks for the phone calls. If you didn't get through, please try again next week or email or tweet us again. We'll be right back after this. This is something you don't see every day at Bryant Denny Stadium on the playing field. In fact, you've never seen it before. A Rolls Royce getting driven on the field. That's because Kristen Saban, Coach Saban's daughter, got married Saturday night in Tuscaloosa. They had the reception at the zone and then got a ride on the field. Coach Saban, of course, giving away his daughter. And can you imagine what it was like to ask his permission to, <laughs> to ask her hand? But it all worked out, and Coach Saban seems thrilled that his daughter tied the knot on Saturday night. All right, that is going to do it for the show for this week. The replay tonight at 10.30 here on WVUA TV, or you can catch it anytime at WVUA23.com. For Rodney Orr, I'm Gary Harris. Have a good evening, everybody. We'll see you next week.